I want to thank you all for attending uh, Mr. Makua Gunkyo's lecture on reimagining Japanese cultural identity and society through animation. And um, this event is sponsored by National Endowment for Humanities grants. And so here we have um, our HOM 328 Ancient Culture Tradition class. We also have um, our Dr. Margaret Perry's her class in theater class writings, and we also have Dr. Um, Dalman Child, who's, who's our NEH grant faculty learning community member, and we also have Dr. Cassie Nadeau, who teaches cultural anthropology. And when I was preparing uh, the events for Mr. Gongkyo, um, Mr. Gongkyo actually this is the the third time you were here on our campus. One time. You were here um, with your student. You were doing a um, performance of the kabuki dance with her student. They're all wearing the beautiful kimono with the hair and the wig. Uh, and then two years ago, I brought him back, and he's, uh, he was here to um, perform and with his kabuki master together, and he also gave a lecture afterwards. And uh, so today, when I was trying to prepare for today's events, I first thought because he was um, Mr. Gangkyo is also a kabuki master too. He he earned almost the equivalent of a professor's degree in uh, kabuki performance, and so I know kabuki was one of his expertise. And actually, he just did a sold out performance at um, uh, Northern Simon Museum in Pasadena. Uh, I think like uh, just this past April, it was a sold out performance. And so I know that it will be very, very interesting for many people. But he told me that he also taught at Cal State Fullerton um, on a class on Japanese animation. I said, Japanese animation, wow. So instantly I know this will be something that attracts to um, many people on our campus community. So I, so then I couldn't decide. I was vacillating. So finally I decided, OK, how about he give a, a new lecture on Kabuki to a very, very small audience for the NEH grant um, faculty. Uh, Beckley Learning Community, and then the, the 2 o'clock one for the, the general audience, and sure enough, we, we have many people attending today's lecture, so thank you all for coming. And so let me give you a little bit of brief introduction of Mr. Gonkyo. Mr. Gonkyo actually started his um, training of Japanese classical dance when he was only three years old. And then when he was 17, he was starting actually doing different performances, he traveled around on different area in the United States and performing at different Japanese festivals. And then also when um, he was at um, UCLA, uh, he was selected to attend uh, a study program in Tokyo where he, he learned tea ceremony, chato, flower arrangement, and among many, many different things. And then he also learned um, kabuki dance. And so he was uh, learning from a very, very prestigious, sort of kind of coming from very prestigious sort of kind of lineage of a kabuki dance performance. And for example, at the age of 17, he attended his notary, his, his equivalent of master's degree from the nice headmasters um, and the kabuki actor Bendo Mizuguro. And then and at 26, he was awarded. Uh, Shinhan, the equivalent of professor's degree from Bendo into Guro 10. And so also uh, Mr. Gankyo also earned the title of Bendo Hirochi Guro. And um, so um, he's now actually also working on his PhD um, from UCLA in addition to teaching Kabuki dance and performing Kabuki theater and also teaching at Cal State. Bulletin. So I know he's a super, super easy and super, super swamp. So let's give him a warm welcome. Welcome to our campus. <laughs> Thank you. So we will give you a lecture, and then afterwards, and there's a lot of different things that he actually added, uh, some of the, the, um, the animation as well, too. And then, um, then after that, we'll open up for a question and answer session. Uh, I don't like using mic. So I'm going to use this mic for this. Uh, if you have a problem hearing me in the back, you can just raise your hand uh, and just let me know. It's OK, right? Everyone can hear it? OK. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chan, for having me back, and also to the grant committee uh, for having me be here to talk about um, one aspect of the Japanese culture that's a complete boom um, in Japan and even in the international community, which is animation. And um, you may be thinking, well, why is a kabuki actor talking or teaching about animation? 
Uh, and through this course, or through this lecture, I hope to make that clear uh, by understanding the possible aspects of Japanese culture, history, uh, and to apply that to the animations that we see. How can we reinterpret the animations um, that are out in today? And how and where are the directors and the producers taking some of the concepts? Um, and how from Japanese history or from world history? And how does it, how is it being applied? And how does it come across? How do you as an audience, not knowing anything about Japanese culture history, for example, can understand the animation on a different level than perhaps what you may have already seen? So today, I'm going to give you guys a brief history on animation and manga, which is comic book uh, drawings in Japan, starting from the Nara period, which is going back all into the hundreds and going tracing that all the way to the modern day, and then I will look at certain case studies of uh, certain animations, um, and I brought clips in that you guys look at as I talk about, so you are all on the same page. However, animation is kind of graphic um, and sexual in content. So, for those, I'm just going to give you guys a warning. For those who um, would like to look away, you may look away at some point. I'll let you guys know before I show the clips if there's some graphic um, mutation things going on. Um, if you're kind of queasy about those, I am. Um, or if there's some sexual context, um, I will also let you know. For some reason, if you have some kind of uh, moral obligations that you can't, um, again, I'll let you know before that happens. Um, so, with that, let's. So really quickly, I'm um, Professor Chang at the University. My real name is actually Kirk Kanesaka. I decided to go ahead with my real name uh, because I lecture under Kirk Kanesaka, my real name. Uh, and today, since it's not on Kabuki or on uh, hostile Japanese dance, I decided to go ahead and use my real name. So uh, you can ask me anything um, to say, hey, Kirk, that's that. And uh, I'll respond to you. Uh, I'm Professor Chang, I said I'm a PhD student uh, at UCLA, and my the field of research is not modern Japanese, it's not modern Japanese literature or culture, it's actually classical Japanese. And so I'm a classic scholar looking at, particularly right now for my dissertation, um, the supernatural and animal motifs uh, that are found within the Kabuki theater and that represents uh, the popular culture, the popular Edo period culture, which is from 1603 to 1868. So that's my area of uh, expertise and of interest. Uh, but again, in order to do this research, I look all the way back to the beginnings in Japanese culture, uh, back to the Nara period, pre Nara period, and even back to uh, Chinese. Uh, so I can also, I'm also a scholar of classical Chinese, and I look at Ming Dynasty literature that influenced highly uh, the Tokugawa literature uh, at that time period. Uh, I also have my master's, I received my master's from uh, USC, where I also specialized in classical Japanese. At that time, I wasn't looking at Edo period, I was looking at it from a different period, uh, which is the medieval period, which is about 1200s uh, in Japan. I am, as a Kabuki actor, uh, as Professor Chan has said, my name is Nakamura Dante. I'm an apprentice to the National Living Treasure, which is this photo up above me, uh, and his name is Sakata Tochuro. He is currently, I mean, I should say, he's about 80s, um, but he is probably one of the top, or he is actually the top performing public actor in Japan um, today. And so even though at his age, public actors we perform until the day that we die. Um, and it's because of that white makeup and the illusion that we can create. So then you may ask yourself, again, come returning to the question, why am I, or why am I talking about anime? And Japan, as I will go through in the lecture today, has this very much, uh, idea of the other, and the idea of reality and fiction. Reality of right now, the present day, and this kind of illusionary world, and the fictional world. And of course, this is not just unique to Japan, but you can find this in many different cultures. Um, and animation is one way of escaping reality, just as much as Kabuki here is a way to escape reality with Edo people. And during the time of the Tokugawa period, there was a lot of laws against the merchant class. Um, this class structure was very rigid, uh, and people were oppressed. And in order to escape the day of lives, they turned to the Kabuki theater and entered this theater or this world that transported them 
into this fantasy world where anything went. And animation and even film, cinema, does the same thing for you guys, too. Right? And so that's the link that I'm very interested in. It's the concept of us and them, the other, um, the outsiders versus the insider, the periphery versus the center. Uh, and as I look at these animes, uh, this is the type of idea, the concept behind reimagining the Japanese society was trying to break down the stereotypes that we may have in Japan. And by doing and looking at anime in this sense. Uh, so really quickly, uh, why anime is, I'm going to look at the history of Japan, the history of manga and anime. The case studies I'm going to look at is Princess Mononoke, Mononoke Kime, uh, Rains of Firefly, Sohai Mahaka. Um, I'm going to look at Akira, uh, Metropolis, Sakura. I'm also going to have a, I forgot to put it in there, but uh, a clip on um, Ghost in the Shell. How many people have seen these already? I'm sure a lot of you guys. A lot of you should probably see Princess Mononoke, right? Uh, and so I didn't bring clips of Mononoke in here because I thought the majority of you guys have seen it all. Debating between Mononoke and uh, Spirited Away, but I wanted to look at, give you guys a reinterpretation of how to really look at the aren't you know? So, why anime? To you guys, how many of you have seen anime? Everybody has seen anime. What does anime mean to you guys? Gore. Excuse me? Gore or blood. Gore or blood? Okay. <laughs> Again, representing the type of other world, right? Things that maybe we can't do. Right? Good. What else? Anything Super else? Powers. Super? Superpowers. Superpowers. Right. A lot of the characters have superpowers, right? Um, abilities beyond <laughs> what we can do as men, right? Or men. What else? Over exaggerated style. The over exaggerated style of some some producers, right? Other producers are very simple, uh, and I won't be showing any uh, those clips today. Simple, simplistic style. But yeah, there's a lot of over exaggeration to it too. Like the large eyes, like the fascination of the eyes, and I'll look at it. Um, the idea of the notion of eyes. Uh, in Sakura, which is actually a manga, a comic book that's redone into an animated, not animated, and so live uh, feature. So, beforehand, maybe before the 80s, um, actually before the 90s, probably even during the 80s, when you think of Japan or Japanese studies, what things that were attracted were the no fear, for example. What is no fear? You know, this exotic otherness of no fear, the mysteriousness. No fear. Um, it's what scholars are looking at. Things like the temple, Buddhist studies will look at, um, this is a picture of Togaiji, but to look at what is Japanese Buddhism, again, it's categorized in Japan as almost this other. Um, and we also think of, again, this type of uh, Buddhist statue. We think about samurai, perhaps, uh, the tea ceremony, uh, things that are the flower arrangement, um, and of course, kabuki. Right. These are the things that typically scholars would have looked at um, maybe pre-90s. But now with anime, right, maybe a lot of you guys may not know a lot of these things. Right? Uh, but now with anime, everybody knows <laughs> Which is Sailor Moon. Or perhaps not so much, but what is this? Astro Boy. Astro Boy, right? What about this? Oh, maybe not this one. Uh, but this is Murakami. Right, who does the LV bags. Um, and in Japan, it influences a lot of animation uh, today. How many of you have seen Summer Wars? Summer Wars, you can tell, right? The style is very uh, familiar. Uh, of the Land of Oz. Sonic, right? Uh, so, of course, this is Spirited Away, Send the Chihiro. And, of course, Pokemon. Right? Pokemon, you can probably do a whole study on Pokemon. And the idea of the family structure, a uh, single boy, the imagination of a boy, uh, and it's very fascinating, right? Um, and the idea that Pokemon, for example, uh, the main character is very ambiguous. You don't know what nationality he is, right? Um, and that was the next view more strongly uh, to the story, to animation, right? Compared to, for example, the live action. Because live action, it's very much already defined. Right? 
So really quickly, um, as I'm talking through, um, sometimes I'm going to make references um, to the history of Japan. And so I've kind of broke it down in your head. You don't have to know all the dates, or you don't have to know um, everything. It's just for you, when I talk about, okay, the Nara period, um, or uh, the Muromachi period, how does it generally fall into the time frame? So we have the pre nara period, which um, actually, I should talk a little bit about, uh, or I should have broken dates of the different time periods before, because as we look at Moronoke and Moronoke, there is a time period uh, of the Jomo period, the rope period, um, that predates the Nara period. But you have the pre Nara period as a group kind of together, the Nara period, which is about 710 to 794, the Heian, um, the Kamakura, the Muromachi, um, the Momoyama, the Edo period, uh, which is my specialty. And then you have the Meiji. And so from 1868 down, we call this modern Japan. Uh, and so any scholars who are studying modern Japan would be studying from the Meiji period, the Taisha period, the Showa period, and the Heisei period. Anything be uh, before uh, the Meiji period, we call it pre-modern. Uh, and then the medieval period is going to be this type of Kamakura all the way to the Momoyama period would be considered the medieval period. And then, um, the classical era would be the Heian period um, in Japan. So as I'm talking about these different time periods, just kind of keep it in the back of your mind um, and kind of have a general idea of where these times are kind of lined up. So the history of the manga and anime, I'm going to start uh, going. Uh, I'm going to start off with the Choju Iga or these animal scrolls. And these animal scrolls were found in a Buddhist temple. Um, up kind of like on the east of the Buddhist temple as they were cleaning them, and they just came out. And we believe that these are dating back to this 1053, to the, uh, about 1053 to 1140. So you're looking at toward the end of the Heian period into the beginning of what we call the medieval period. Uh, and these scrolls are all animal scrolls containing different type of um, images that is almost a parody of the world that the Japanese society at the time. So here you have uh, the frog and the hare they're doing wrestling, a sumo match. You'll have other pictures of um, a frog all dressed up in a uh, priest robe, but they're all getting drunk, and then they're all playing strip poker, right? Uh -huh. And then there's only one, one frog grizzly praying on their behalf, right? So you might think, okay, well, what does this have to say? But that says a lot about society, because that's telling already is that even though a parody about the corruption within the Buddhist society, among the Buddhist clergy already at that time, right? Otherwise, these things wouldn't be made a parody of. Um, and so these type of animal scrolls um, also shows this kind of humorous side. And a lot of the scholars are saying that, well, this is sort of the beginning of manga, these um, comic books. And going into the medieval period, as times in Japan gets more darker, um, with the idea of the Buddhist notion of mappo, which is this type of the decline of the Dharma and um, the world is coming to an end. It's almost a type of Armageddon in a way. Um, you have this Gaki Zoshi, which is a hungry ghost scroll. And of course, this is not just unique in Japan. Um, you see this in all Buddhist uh, paintings, but you see the scrolls coming out. And so you can see here, for example, these hungry ghosts coming out and eating. Um, and the idea behind the hungry ghosts is that they're part of these creatures that sin in this life, and so forever they are doomed to be hungry. And so no matter how much they eat, no matter how much they eat, they'll always be hungry. And here also they're um, feeding off of the corpse of uh, uh, sinners. There's a person here um, that's probably a, a, another sinner that um, would be eaten by this kind of ghost. Um, then there's also these type of jikoku doshi, which are hell scrolls. And in this particular uh, scroll, it's a little bit uh, uh, grotesque, uh, but what it is is these people, uh, actually these are actually women, are swimming around in menstrual blood. Uh, and this is one of the dictations of hell that if you sin in this world, uh, one of the levels of hell is this uh, floating around in menstrual blood. And the menstrual blood, you may ask why, is because it's considered to be impure, very impure. And so in classical Japan, um, the notion of childbirth is actually, even though it's joyous occasion, is also very 
defiled because of the blood and perhaps during childbirth, the child may be lost. And so when a woman is actually giving birth, um, they usually transport her from not in her house, but into a special designated area um, so that the defilement will be kept in that area. Here you have the um, health scroll, another level of um, excretement um, and magnets. So this is kind of like urine and uh, feces. People are doomed to swim in here while these type of maggots are heating off of their flesh. Um, and going beyond that then, from the medieval period, now jumping into the Tokugawa period, you start seeing not hand-drawn scrolls, but woodblock prints. And we call this Tukiyoi. And one of the very famous Tukiyoi are the Old Tsue prints, the Old Tsue. A means picture, and Old Tsue is a region uh, about north of Kyoto. Uh, and here they have these woodblock prints of, for example, the demon during Buddhist chanting dance. You have the posterior maiden, uh, and you'll have um, a young boy with his hog, just different sceneries uh, representing a series of holes to it. Also, you have pictures of the floating world, uh, which you have pictures of like a kabuki actor. You have these type of seasonal pictures now coming into play, and perhaps uh, famous supporters of geishas. These are actually geisha. And so now, the ukiyo is being sold as souvenir. So beforehand, before this woodblock invention, um, everything had to be hand drawn. So it's a very, very costly thing. Now with the woodblock, these prints can be mass produced and sold off as souvenirs. So in Japan, it's very limited on how much you can travel. Like today, you can just hop on a plane and boom, you're already in Tokyo or you're in some part of the world and you're on vacation. But in Japan, travel is very restricted by the Tokugawa period. And so by being able to go somewhere, and to purchase this type of memento is very much of a big theme. And of course, um, afterwards, it's just like a postcard. If you buy a postcard, you're like, oh, look, I went. And then maybe like a year later, you just throw it away, right? And so these Bukiwe prints were very much like that. I mean, Japanese people were just perhaps wrapping their own plates and things with it. It wasn't until um, the Westerners came into Japan, and I believe it was the French, who looked at it and said, wow, this is amazing that Japan was, oh my god, we're sitting on this treasure. Um, and then this Ukiyo-e prince kind of became uh, into this more, uh, more prominent in the art world that represents Japan. So then going into now um, the Meiji period, Japan at this time will focus um, coming out from this type of quote-unquote seclusion, even though it wasn't completely secluded due to the Tokugawa period. The United States will come in and knock on Japan's door around 1865, I believe, is around the first time that Commodore Perry would come in and say that you guys need to open your doors up to the United States. Let the United States trade with you. And at the time, uh, Japan didn't want to open up, uh, but they were at a loss on the uh, on military, right? Because Commodore Perry from the United States were coming in cannons with what we call the Kurokune, which is these black ships, machines, steam ships, while Japan didn't have this kind of technology. And so what ended up happening in uh, 1868, there was a revolution in Japan, and the imperial order, the imperial family is restored to power, and there's this race for modernity, and just to modernize Japan. Japan viewed itself in two ways. It could fall victim as a colony of the European powers, as much as the Asian counterparts were, or they can modernize themselves and become a equal power to the West. And this is what ended the, the route that they chose. And so there's a lot of um, Western journalists that came in at this time, and one of them was Charles Brookman from uh, England, from London, and he created in Yokohama what we call the Japan Punch. And this is uh, one of the very first type of political uh, cartoons, I guess you can say, that is being presented in Japan. And one of his major um, contribution to Japanese uh, pictures now is this idea of the balloon. Right? So if you look at the Sunday comics, right, you see Garfield talking or thinking, you see this kind of bubble, and then you see the bubble, and you see the words, what he's thinking about, right? So Charles Whitman is actually the person who introduced this concept. So you have two political figures being drawn, they'll draw the bubble, and then the words are saying it. So then now uh, Japanese 
uh, political satires will now incorporate this within their own works. So in Japan, you can see that it's not animation or manga, it's not just the Japanese thing. But beforehand, you have in China, the influence of the Chinese ink paintings, woodblock paintings. These are all coming from China that they develop, and now this type of influences from the West. And so the earliest anime itself, and animation is not, again, Japan, but it's from Europe. Um, and it was developed in, uh, in Western Europe. And one of the earliest anime itself that survives today comes from 1917, and where the samurai, by then, the samurai were already disbanded. Um, they were no longer, it was illegal for you to carry a sword or to have the top of the knot. Uh, but if this is a cartoon that's only this one kind of segment exists, uh, where this samurai has this new sword where he wanted to test it out on killing this monk, uh, and he fails miserably. And so already you can see how cartoons are being used to comment about the old society, right? Because there's a still a resistance, of, especially in the countryside, against modernizing itself, right? Your whole way of life up to now is completely changed. And, and there's this phrase. And so this type of early animation is also used to kind of make a comment about society and how and what we should do, right, in fear. Uh, going into uh, a little bit more, the pre-1960s, you have uh, Kensuka Osamu, uh, and he's considered to be the manga no kakisama, the god of, of manga, uh, of comic books. And, we will see today Metropolis. I will show you Metropolis, but he was the uh, originator of Metropolis, um, his manga series. That was his rework into the animation film, like here of 2001. Uh, but he was a very interesting character. Uh, he, as a boy, was very interested in uh, drawing, and so he kept his diary of a bunch of uh, drawings that he did. And when he got older, when he created these comic books, he looked to his childhood diary and took all the inspiration from that diary. And so even though it's, as an adult he's manufacturing these comic books, it's actually all based on childhood, uh, a child's imagination. Right? And so he was the one who created like, Adam Boy, he created um, uh, the Ribbon Princess, is how it's translated in English, um, he creates all these type of fantasy worlds. And I'll show you how Metropolis, right, uh, Metropolis, is then transformed to his imagination and what he's commenting on at the same time around him. Uh, before that, um, after this type of uh, animated cell for the 1917, uh, follows this uh, Shimoka Oten, creates these type of short clips that were commercials. Um, that was a preview uh, before the cinema film. And one of the leading type of uh, person in support of film in Japan at this time is Tanizaki Juichiro. So maybe a lot of you guys uh, in one of your classes in Japan may read some works by him, but he writes this book called In Face of Shadows. Uh, but by then, his idea of Japan has completely changed. And the beginning is very much embracing uh, modernity, the Western concept, and film. Because this fascination with the other the idea that the screen is capturing this motion picture, this person, but the person's not there, right? What about the soul of that person? Is the soul captured in that movie, right? These are all the things that fascinate him. And then as he's looking at these Western concepts, these Western notions, he ended up reverting back to saying that the Japanese way is the best, way, right? And the Japanese way, what, one of the ways that represents Japan is actually not the light, but it's the shadows. And he writes this short um, commentary called The Face of Shadow. And so cinema is this kind of big boom. Then the animation films, the short features are coming in. And then after the defeat of Japan uh, to the Allies in 1945, the Japanese Navy commissions this short animated film. It's about three minutes. And it's called Mokoro uh, Divine Sea Warriors. And it's about the Navy. And the 
commission this animation to try and boost the morale of the children um, who are defeated. And if we have time, I need to skip over. If I have time, I'll go into Grace the Firefly, which is um, about World War II, but from the viewpoints of kind of the victims, the viewpoints of the people living in Japan, okay? not the military, but from the children's perspective. Uh, and in the 1960s, we have this change. Um, one of the big series on NHK was this type of calendar series um, of 19, it started in 1962. Again, these were only three minute clips, but it ran for uh, a couple years. And then you have the introduction of Kitsuan Adam, Astro Boy, which again um, is based on Os uh, Osamu's uh, manga version. Okay? And then you have Tsutsuji uh, Nijihachiko. And so the idea that um, these two different type of robot ideas are now coming in, right? So the Tetsuji Nijihachiko, the animator, uh, is a boy who is able to control robots, right? And compared to Astro Boy, um, which is this type of artificial human that's coming in. And so already by the 1960s, these ideas of the AI of robot is coming into play, but it's playing off of the idea of human rights. And so in the 1950s and 60s and, and 70s in the United States, you have this type of civil rights movement, you have the women rights movement, um, this idea of human rights are coming into play. And so in order to kind of reflect this, like uh, Osama, oh, I'm sorry, Osama would uh, then kind of create these kind of robot figures. And so then the ideas of robot rights, which you'll see in Metropolis, is a big issue that comes through. Uh, and the type of form, right? Again, it's them versus us, that type of issue um, that's going to come through. And then in the 1970s, you have this huge leap in anime, the way that anime is created, that the way that anime is made. And one of them, um, you have this type of uh, Gundam series uh, that comes through, but also Miyazaki Hayao now steps up into the animation film, right? And one of his first animated films were uh, Lupin the Third. Uh, and of course, Lupin the Third didn't do very well, and so he it was a very much a struggle for him, but at the same time, uh, music is going to play a big role. And so their kind of goal for the musical side is to create their own soundtracks that people will want to buy. And so now, music is no longer this type of children melody, la 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 la, right? Uh, but it's more this type of classical um, score sheets that you'll see maybe if you've been in Jones series um, or Star Wars, right? It's, it's a really good one where the score kind of just remains. With you. And so a lot of these animations are now trying to be paired up with these um, scores of music, and hopefully the scores of music will be able to be uh, marketed on its own. And in the 80s, 90s, um, and into now, you have this, again, advancement in the plot. The plots become more very complex. Um, how many people have seen, for example, Paprika? I see a hand that always goes up. Paprika is this weird, trippy uh, animation animation. Right? Um, and it's, it's fairly recent in Japan, but it has an idea of how many people have heard the dream machine, if you have taken a philosophy class. The dream machine. Should we be hooked up to this machine and live a life of dreams? It's not living life, you know. Um, and this idea of Paprika is being hooked up to a dream machine and sharing people's dreams. And what happens when this dream machine is stolen with people's dreams in them? Do you steal people's identity? Can people's identities be stolen? And this paprika approaches this in many different ways. Um, and of course you have the, the computer generated uh, and the treaty. And so as I'm looking at the different case studies today, I'll also look at, for example, I keep going back to Metropolis, but the whole beginning of Metropolis is done through computer animation. And after that, painstakingly, everything is all hand drawn. And the producer or the director is very cautious about this movie. And so I'll, I'll talk about it as we look at it. And so I wanted to first then look at Mononoke Kimo, Princess Mononoke. Uh, again, how many people have seen this anime? OK, so um, maybe I should have put this. And, uh, sorry about it. Uh, but as we look at it, uh, Princess Mononoke is supposedly supposed to take place in the Muromachi period, which is 
right after the end of the Aeon Hoxville period and going into this medieval period. Uh, and we have these different, very um, looks or readings on Mononoke, which is the idea of man versus nature. You also have this outsider versus insider. Um, Suzanne Napier is a professor at the University of Texas, and she's one of the very first professors on an academic level to write on anime. And she produces, um, she produced a book um, in the second edition, and uh, she's been a lecturer on anime. She, her main focus is actually on uh, modern Japanese literature. Um, although she's very Freudian in her approach, and sometimes um, I disagree with her, and I'll let you guys know as I'm talking about um, I'm talking about the different interpretations, and we want to be careful of not to impose our own type of views on something that may not be there. Um, and so there's this type of humanistic approach and the Buddhist approach as we look at some of the uh, So, Sam, uh, which is this quote unquote one of the men, um, Miyazaki Hayao bases her off of the Jomon period, which is the Jomon um, academia that has this type of, is known for the rope pottery. And as you can tell between the two, um, Sam wears this mask uh, when she's attacking, uh, but it's very much similar. Um, and so he bases Sam off this Jomon period compared to this Muromachi period, uh, which is this type of more advanced in arms, uh, this trade in, with China, uh, and advancement of technology that's going on, and so it's prehistoric type of history being mixed with quote unquote the modern period at the time of uh, And then of course uh, Ashtaka is representing this type of northern tribes um, called the Emishi tribes. And so if you watch the opening of Mononoke Men, it shows him, um, it shows the village being attacked by this boar god, that's raging boar god, and the boar god curses Ashtaka, and he's now expelled from his tribe, and this whole opening scene shows him crossing these great plains, and nature, and coming into, going from the outside, the periphery, to the center, where the problem is. Um, even though in Japan, and even in Chinese um, civilization, right, the court is at the center of civilization, that's where Silka it's more civilized, that's where you want to be compared to the periphery, right? And the periphery is all chaos, it's all barbaric, it's all wilderness, it's wild. But in this viewpoint, Miyazaki shifts this idea of the outside being clean, being pure, right? And the taintedness comes from the center, right? Which is society. And so it's interesting to see this type of double play as you're looking at how history books are written, how historical documents are written, and how shrewd or screwed um, their viewpoints are. And so, again, this is kind of the opening scene. You have Ashtaka being attacked by the, the god, um, and so balance this harmony between nature and man that's destroyed. Something that you may make me associate with, for example, quote unquote Shinto. Right? Even though Shinto that we understand today is a modern construct. It's a Meiji construct of how we view Shinto. Shinto and Buddhism was merged in pre-modern uh, times. Right? So up to the Tokugawa period, until the, the Meiji government stressed that there needs to be separation between uh, you know, foreign and uh, us, Shinto and Buddhism coincided together. So, but in this case, he's also drawing on the idea of living in nature, living with harmony with one another, right? compared to this kind of society, this fortress um, that produces these uh, iron cores, right? Also, building off this idea of outsiders versus insiders, again, I was talking about the center, the capital versus the periphery. Where is it? Where does the problem really lie? Is it really so barbaric away from the capital? Um, but it's interesting, in this Mononoke Hime, the center, the quote unquote, the court center, is absent. It's only mentioned once, if you look at it, if you watch this film. And that's when the monk says that he wants to give the Shishigami's head to the emperor. And that was it. So now then, you have to think about, so what, is, what does it mean to have a lack of center? And where is the center? The center is always being shifted, right? 
Uh, and so from whose viewpoint are we viewing this term? I talked about this rigid um, social structure and the hini or the outcast, which is the type of untouchable class members. This town uh, is all based on, the, the iron core town is all based off of these outsiders, the prostitutes, the lepers, the, uh, the weak men, right? And this is how this town was created. Uh, and so what does it mean, again, to have this type of connection among each other? What does it mean to be a community, for example? If, for example, all of us here are connected because we are all scholars, we are all students, uh, forever, even though you become a professor, you're also always studying. In that sense, we all are. But you guys are all one community in the sense because you guys are all members, are all part of the campus here. I'm not. I'm an outsider in that sense. So this idea is, again, the outsider versus insider, who's in, who's out, and from what viewpoint. It's very important when watching one another. And of course, I get the local cause versus Buddhism. Um, even though I was mentioning that the gods and the Buddhas are merged, there's all these very kind of conflict that goes on. Uh, this very tension that's being played between the two types of religions, quote unquote, that we think of. And the idea of beast versus human, like the wolves, the boar versus the human race. Uh, one thing that I will mention uh, is those of you who have seen uh, Mononoke Hime, that Stuart Napier, again, imposes this very Freudian sexual view. And one of the things, um, one of the things that she comments, if you read her book, is the scene when Sam is um, sucking the blood out from her quote unquote mother, the Moros, um, Moros uh, womb, when Moro gets kind of shocked by the gun. And she talks about saying that, oh, this is representation of the menstrual cycle, her Sam's menstrual blood, because she has this fur coat, and so that represents da 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 da, blah 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 blah. blah. And uh, that's completely absurd, because Miyazaki would never, never write or direct anything that goes against this type of family values. And in his um, press releases and his talks, he will never have this type of sexual um, interpretation of things. And instead, though, what I think is interesting and what's fascinating is this idea that Sam is being labeled as another, as part of a different member, right? She's, she lies in a very ambiguous state. She's a human, but she's being raised by wolves, by animals, right? So she's on the borderline of the periphery or the center we don't know, right? But by having the blood, which is the defilement, she associates herself with the beast world, the world of the beast. And at the same time, with these war pain, even though nature suggests that this is kind of a very sexual connotation, this also is painting her as being different, right? Tattoos did the same thing, right? In Japan, used to be um, criminals will get tattooed so that you know that that person is a you know, criminal. Uh, but at the same time, this war pain does the same effect. Another thing that I think Nature failed to mention is the fact that red is a very erotic color. True, it is very erotic color. So it gives her the sense of uh, feminine look. Even though she's very fierce in this look, everything around her is all white except for the red. And the red has this very type of what we call iroke, <coughs> which I cannot translate, it's almost nearly impossible. It has this type of sexual um, type of uh, charm uh, to her, I would say that, as a womanly charm, I guess, as you could say. So as you read material in the future, also keep in mind the author's uh, standpoint. What does the author look at? What does he or she research? Uh, what does he or she uh, main interests are. Uh, and then see if that type sort of line of argument kind of pollutes perhaps the real meaning that, or pollutes what that person is trying to say. Um, so try and keep this in mind too as we look at anime. Um, how much of what we understand of Japan pollutes perhaps what might not be there. Um, and so that's the reason why I kind of bring up that type of uh, look. I'm going to um, finish that. I want to get into Graves of the Fire. How many people have seen Graves of the Fire? It's a very sad movie, right? 
Uh, and for those who haven't, uh, if I spoil the ending, I'm really sorry. Um, but the plot is very, very simple. It's about two children, and already you know both children are dead, even before the story unravels itself. And it's a journey of how these two children survive um, during the last stages of World War II, uh, when New Colombia was being firebombed by the Allies, and the war ends, um, and how these two epic, um, children try to survive. And the uses of color, for example, whenever the director is doing the flashbacks, uh, it's always painted in red. So you know that it's a flashback, right? And again, there are these type of spirits um, in this world. And it, this is kind of like the opening scene. You see, you already see um, one of the main actors, the main char the characters, is looking back at his dead body. And this is kind of the opening scene, the segment in the train station, and then it kind of goes into his little sister. And again, the color is already red right, to show the type of transition um, between this world and that world uh, at the same time. Did you guys know who's seen it? This was actually paired with my neighbor, Tokoro. It may be kind of shocking, but this was a double feature when it was first released by Studio Ghibli. And so the initial reaction of the audience, too, was very interesting. Because those people who saw Totoro first, those um, theaters that showed Totoro halfway through Raves of the Firefly, it was so depressing, people just walked out. But those people who saw were shown Raves of the Firefly first thought, oh my god, how sad, you know, how, you know, da 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 da. But then they stayed and watched My Neighbor the Totoro. Right? It's kind of a little more happy uh, in that sense. So again, how are the anime viewed and shown? And to what audience is also very important as we look at and examine the uh, anime world. Um, within Grave um, of the Firefly, they use a very, the producer, um, the director uses a very classical uh, poetic term. Does that speak um, also? The director also actually uses this in his films. Uh, but it's this idea of, um, that comes from Japanese poetry during the Heian period, the Nara period, called Pillow Words. And for example, here's a poem by, that's credited to Samin Mata, which is kind of debatable, but you have this poem that says, this is it, the continual party of going and coming for those who you know and those who you do not know, the gate at the meeting hill, which is talking about the barrier uh, between Osaka and this type of um, road towards Edo. And the pillow word in this, what we call makura kotoba, comes from this term, korea, korea kono, which we have no idea what this means. We can only speculate what this means. And so this makura kotoba is this type of words that are supposed to conjure up an image that was known to those people at that time but has been lost. Um, and in this particular case, we assume that Korea Kuno is conjuring up the guardian goddess of this barrier to ask her for safe passage on your journey. And so it's kind of that this moment, Korea Kuno, and then you kind of pause there. Uh, ikumo kairumo, wakaretsutsu. So in that sense, you stop, you reflect, you look at the image, and then you continue on. And so these are what we call what are called pillow shots or screenshots um, that originate, originally was used by Ozu Dasujiro. Um, and for those who like Taiwan films, um, Hao Sao Qian, if I pronounced the name correctly, um, was very much influenced by Ozu. So if you look, watch like a, a good man, good woman, one of them, um, things like that, he uses these type of pillow shots also. Like these shots where nothing happens, but it's a moment for you to reflect. And so these shots are also used um, in the animation. For example, um, towards the beginning, when the Kobe is being firebombed, you have this very long shot with the bomb falling around Seita, which is a boy, and Setsuko, which is his um, younger sister. And there he is. You see it's framed in this narrow type of passageway, and you see them. Sorry, the pictures are kind of blurry, but you see both of them there. And he stops and he looks back. And he looks, then the next scene is to this water, right? Because Japanese at this time was trained to stop whatever you're doing, 
to go and fight the fire, right? So in his mind, he's contemplating, right? He looks at the slaughter, he goes, should I fight, right? Should I fight the flames? And then there's another shot. Shot three is to the bucket next to the, the water well, and then you have a ladder and this type of uh, mop where you're supposed to put the ladder against and put the mop with water and then spray water and try to combat. And so you have these type of, you can understand what's going on also in St. Louis' mind. Right? I was thinking, should I do this? Should I go? What should I do? And ultimately, uh, taking one last glance, he just takes off. Right? And so these are the type of pillow shots that you can just go from, for example, this shot, and then all the way to, to this shot, and say, OK, I'm out of here. Right? But through these pillow shots, you have a time of reflection, a moment to reflect. Should I do this? What's going on? And it gives the audience a reading room. And that's what's really interesting about uh, Rain to the Firefly, if you look at it that way. And also, the simplicity in it. A lot of the scenes look like watercolor for um, It's just very ambiguous in its state. And that's what the beautiful charm of it. And if this was a live action film, I think the point would have been this. Because having to see the same private ride, I made a mistake going and seeing it, and it was completely sold out. So I had to sit in this front seat, and then you look up, and I just saw body parts flying and blood, and I was like, Ugh. and I was just like throwing up everywhere. It's the same idea. If there's a live action film, I think too much emphasis would have been on that death, blood, blood spewing out, you know. It just would have hit the complete message and the theme of the animation. And so in that sense, what are the differences between animation and live action? It's a really good, interesting thing. Would this, for example, this is based on a book um, by an actual author who lost his um, sister during this time, but at the same time, would this have been different? And this actually has been made into a drama in, in Japan, but the animation is way 10 times full, more emotional for the audience. So why is that? So then now I want to jump to Akira. How many people have seen Akira? Akira is kind of like, oh my god, like, this is it for animation, right? Um, a lot of otaku people. How many people are otaku people? See, I heard laughter, so you definitely you should know. What does otaku mean? Fanboy. Fanboy. Good. So those people who are totally into the animation world, right? But otaku means house, my house, right? And the reason why you're called otaku is because you stay within your house, and all, that's all you do, right? Supposedly, and that's what the term otaku comes from. But in the international community, Akira was one of the films, the animated films, that just blew everyone out of the water. And again, you have this concept of outsider versus insider, um, Tetsuo, and kind of the game. Um, and Japan in this versus the world. Um, the idea of Japan's bubble economy, um, and Japan sprouting up into this type of world power. How does the world view it? How does the world view China today? Right? How many people are, or how many uh, people are very scared that we're going to be overtaken by the Chinese because the Chinese have a superpower, or, or even India in that sense? Nineteen eighties, maybe a lot of you guys just getting born. Uh, I was a nineteen eighties child, but I always remember things like, oh my God, one day Japan is going to. Uh, we're all going to be overran by Japanese. Um, you know, there's very much, um, not so much as the type of witch hunts during the 1950s uh, or the Cold War period, but it's very much fear that was going on. Um, and so this idea of how does Japan fit in this world? The new Tokyo versus the old Tokyo is also being kind of shown within this film, this animation. And the idea of humans versus Nikon, right? The boy versus the superpower. So you have now these type of superpowers. Um, and one thing I want to look at is this idea by Benjamin Stevens of the very ending, um, which is, I am Tetsuo. Uh, uh, and up to now, the main focus was Akira, this person that is in body parts that's been kind of been dispersed, and that Akira is supposed to have a superpower, and yet at the very end, the whole screen goes blank, and then it says, Orewa Tetsuo. So who is this I? Who is Tetsuo? What? Right? It's not I am Akira. That's interesting, right? And up to now, Tetsuo also always refers to himself as Boku. Boku. So if you know Japanese, Boku means I, but it's kind of more uh, masculine way. 
And Oren is I2, but it's more derogatory to I. Right? And so now it's this, um, the idea of that. Uh, and then, again, I kind of wrote these questions, um, the outcome of the story. So I'll show you a clip of Akira. into um, the last segment, when, oh, uh, it's so communicated, so if you're kind of easy about things like that, uh, you may want to look at
僕は鉄を
Uh, and as I go through, you have this metropolis of the 1927. So if you're a film student, uh, perhaps you can't come across this. This is actually uh, was directed uh, by a German uh, filmmaker uh, in Germany. Uh, and he creates uh, Metropolis 1927. And you have Metropolis 1949, which is uh, Osama's version of it, which is the comic book version. But it's interesting because um, Tesca, right? Osama Tesca, Tesca does not or never seen the 1927 version. All he saw was a poster. And this had the face, uh, the, the face, I think it's the right, uh, of the robot. And he loved the name Metropolis, and he loved the robot image, and he created this whole comic book series based off of that. Just those two things. He never seen this. And then you have the Metropolis of 2001. And so um, the original version of Metropolis was uh, by a person named Fritz Wong, and he bases it on Bia von Harbour's novel, which was his girlfriend, this is his girlfriend. And he models this uh, city of Metropolis, not on a European city, but when he traveled to New York and he saw the skyscrapers, he saw the airplanes flying around, he thought that this was the city of the future, and so Metropolis and his version is based off of that. And so even in the animated film, you can kind of see the reminiscence of the 20s, the music, um, some of the ideas, the costuming, but also the city itself um, it kind of does conjure up the image uh, perhaps of New York itself. Um, and it's also this future as well as 2006. Um, but underlining all this is the idea of the industrial revolution. What is the price that we must pay to become industrialized? Should we sacrifice um, human rights, workers' rights, um, and for the sake of the country? And again, these are the ideas and things that are being echoed in the 19, late 1940s, 1950s, as Japan races to redevelop itself, to create itself as a superpower. Um, in the future, and to uh, kind of clean itself up after World War II from devastation. Uh, and so then you can also kind of have this uh, Christian socialism view. Uh, Marina being the woman um, as the central Donna figure. Uh, the Christ, uh, what happens is this, uh, she dies, and so then um, her lover wants to resurrect her and creates this type of uh, robot image of her. And so this storyline is completely different uh, from Metropolis, or even from uh, the animated film, Metropolis itself. I'm going to skip this. Um, this is actually kind of a clip uh, from Metropolis in 1927. Um, it was just to kind of uh, show students some of the themes that were coming through, but you can just go ahead and skip it and go into uh, Pisca's version. Uh, so Pisca, as I mentioned before, is considered the uh, Kamisama, manga no Kamisama, the god of, of manga. Uh, and Again, like I said, he only saw the poster, and he loves to be in Metropolis, and so he bases his version, the manga versus comic version, off of those two things. Um, in the back of his mind, and even in the Metropolis and the manga version um, through the series, he has the idea of the atomic bomb, um, and also the Cold War is going to play between USSR and uh, America. Right? These are the two types of axes of powers that are going to kind of emerge after World War II. Uh, perhaps a lot of you guys you know, remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, uh, things like that. But all of these things are going to be kind of playing into Japan. Where should Japan be? Whose side should they get? USSR or America, right? Um, and so a lot of these things are going to be found within this um, comic version of Metropolis. And also he addresses the idea of globalization. Uh, he makes constant references to Disney, so this is kind of like one uh, drawing that you see who's on that line down, Mickey Mouse. So images that people are now in Japan associating with America. And again, as I mentioned before, animation and manga is always in constant play between Japan and the rest of the world. So this was very much influenced by Disney's Snow White and Seven Dwarf. And so he takes a lot of those elements uh, and creates them into his manga version. And then he creates the white lion, right? Which becomes later what? In, in, uh, in Disney. Simba. The, lion. Simba, the Lion King, right? So you see this constant play between what is considered Japan and America and the dialogue that occurs. And so in this case, too, he's taking elements of Disney. Um, he also makes references to Superman. Um, he has a type of pose like this. Uh, of, um, of uh, the, the robot figure kind of going off into 
why. Uh, and so he plays off these ideas of globalization and the kind of bringing the international community to Japan. At the same time, he also addresses the ideas that I mentioned before, but the ideas of robot rights um, and workers' rights, the industrial revolution. So he does play a little bit, but without knowing uh, off of uh, the German film. But he does mention about this industrial revolution. So if you have seen Metropolis anime, uh, you'll understand what I'm talking about, but the idea of these robots taking human jobs, right? And this revolution, robot revolution, the revolution of the people that are suppressed um, in the town of Metropolis. Uh, and even though it's a little bit later, um, the American Civil Rights Movement um, can also kind of, you see um, elements um, of that throughout. And then the idea of the American occupation, uh, which was 1945 to 1952, Nietzsche is the artificial being. Uh, later on, she'll be called uh, Tima in um, the animated version. But uh, her gender is very ambiguous. She starts out as a girl, and then she transforms into a boy. I'm sorry. She starts out as a boy, and she transforms into a girl. So she herself, or he herself, is kind of ambiguous. Uh, she generates her energy from the radiation of the sun. Of course, this again is echoing the idea of radiation in the atomic bombs that were dropped. Uh, and then she has this type of split personality. So she sticks up for the, um, the people that are suppressed. She makes friends. Um, she's in a sense naive. And she's always seeking or looking for her father or her creator. But at the same time, after she has a her true identity, she becomes this, uh, she flies into rage. Uh, she meets the robot uh, people. Uh, and her goal is kind of destroying the, American, uh, the human race. And one idea is Godzilla. Godzilla is, is, is similar. So you can see her kind of being the default. Um, but at the same time, Godzilla is a creation from what? How is Godzilla created in Japanese? Because of the radiation. From the radiation, right? And so then he comes and destroys some versions, he destroys Tokyo, other versions, he saves Japan. It's one of the two, right? Uh, but it's the same kind of idea, this idea of the radiation um, and atomic uh, lingering. Okay. So here's a clip. This is a little bit long clip. Um, I think it's almost about 10 minutes. So it's going to be the opening. Um, it's going to be the opening and towards the end. I may cut the end uh, off.
問題はロボットと人間労働者間の圧力をどうするかという駅コミでは新駅の開発に着手したそうですがだから我がメトロポリスにはもっと強く象徴的なリーダーが必要なんじゃ政権を取っている限り、我が国は安泰だし、私の出番などあるわけないじゃないか。軍大統領からレッドゴーへ、政界参加の要請は。おいおい、焚きつけないでくれよ。人気じゃレッドゴーには到底かなわないんだから。このジグラット内に、軍関係のステップがあるという噂が一部で流れていますが。レッドポリス市長としてのコメントを一言。そんな話はスカンク国務大臣に聞けばよかろうえおじさんジグラットってどういう意味なんでしょうね知らんおおいあれを見ろよなんだあれはマルトゥークマルトゥークじゃん
how, who does Genji go visit all the time? Uh, Murasaki. Uh, but maybe he doesn't read a lot of it, but he's always traveling to the woman's quarters. He's always traveling to the woman's house. He marries a woman called Aoi, um, and he's always at Aoi's house. The woman never travels to his house. And it's because all the property rights are through the woman. And that's the reason why you marry these type of strong women, is to inherit the property rights. And so the property rights always being passed down from uh, the mother's side uh, to the daughter. And it's not until you have a medieval period that the shift kind of occurs where it becomes more, uh, more male oriented. But in that case, in the supernatural story, a lot of it has to do with powerful women in the gym, right? And one of them is called Fajna, uh, and if you have time, uh, it might be kind of interesting. It's based on four short uh, Japanese supernatural films. Uh, and I'm going to skip those to the show. Uh, so I want to go into then Sakura, which is how manga is now used to influence animated films. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, I'm going to show you the clip first and then talk about Sakura, uh, which came out uh, about 2004 or So I'll show you the clip first and talk about it.
l'amène du nez. Hein. Working on okay, good. And also now, uh, in the meantime, we still have some few minutes. Does anybody have a question you would like to ask, um, Mr. Gongkyo, about Japanese animation? Anybody? Yes, good. All right. Okay, pass on the mic. Uh, what's your favorite or like top two or three movies that you recommend? Uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I would definitely look at Summer Wars. Uh, that's very recent that came out about, I think, 2009. Um, and Summer Wars deals with this idea of reality versus the internet world. Uh, how are we going as a human race? Uh, where are we headed towards? Um, he bases um, Oz off of a, uh, a social network service called Mixi in Japan. It's very popular. It's sort of their Facebook. Uh, but at the same time, it redefines, or it makes you think of what is it to be a family? Um, and is it just by blood relations? And in Japan, it's not. It, um, in China, it may be the idea is stress on uh, passing the family lineage from father to son, producing the male heir. But in Japan, we don't have that. 
we have what we call adoption. So if a family doesn't have a male member, they can adopt someone into the family, and that's still carrying on the family integration. So how does that play into that um, Japanese type of notion of what a family is? Uh, so that's why I probably also um, recommend um, Children Who Chases um, Voices from Deep Love. Um, and this also deals with the idea of concept of life and death. How do you deal with that? How do we cope with that? While also looking at the historicalness, what does it mean to be quote unquote modern versus the type of historical world? Because we actually travel uh, down below the earth into a different realm. Um, and of course, Paprika. Um, these are all kind of recent anime films, but uh, Paprika would be another one that I would recommend highly. Uh, what's the major difference between uh, the Japanese anime and the transfer from that to the American, to like the American style? I don't think there's a, a major a difference um, between the two. I think um, when you think of American anime, you think of cartoons, right? And so to the general public, uh, in, when they first were watching anime, their adults' reactions were, well, this is just for kids, right? Uh, because we always have like Sunday morning cartoons, or Saturday morning cartoons? I can't remember. Saturday. Saturday, sorry. Uh, or like SpongeBob, square pants. Uh, you know, these are the type of things that are most closely associated with Western type of uh, ideas. But then, Japanese animation is very different, and it, it's, it's trying to show stories and things that really can't be done or have will have a different take. I think if it's done in live action um, compared to the anime, and then now there's just have a dialogue between the two, and so you see more and more animation that's being developed. But of course, the start of it is. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs really kicks off and influences animation in Japan to create it into this type of storyline and to create a drama. Um, because I've watched a lot of anime before, and like they have a lot of political ramifications if you watch it, and like has that had an effect on the like, Japanese culture? Because some of the topics are others. <coughs> <coughs> it gets pretty dark and sometimes very uh, anti-governmental or uh, anti-institutional. I mean, how else is how else can you safely voice your voice in a way? Um, how how else can you voice what's going on in society and make a comment on society? And one of the safest ways is actually through anime, I would argue, uh, because at the same time you can always say, ah, ha, 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 that's just a dry, right? We kind of laugh it off. But at the same time, these themes are very dark in, in nature, right? A lot of them deals with the concept of homi right now in Japan, which is those, um, um, I don't know how to translate it, um, those introverted people, right? The concept of kideru, um, uh, uh, the, the young student who all suddenly if you just say, hey, I don't think you should be wearing that, this freaks out and kills you, right? These are all the social things that are actually going on in Japan, but you can't really comment on it, because at the same time, it's in a way, it's scary, scary and at the same time, these children are very, the rights are uh, protected. And so, uh, I was, one of the films, even in some awards, the idea that you can person, the person that's introverted, comes true. But the idea that this all started off majorly in Japan um, in the 19, I think 80s or 90s, uh, when a middle school child killed his colleague uh, and cuts his head off and puts it in front of the gate of the school. And so when all the kids came, they saw this and they freaked out. They said, this is a decapitated head. And he was actually, because he was so minor, he was sent off to prison, um, but he's actually already released now. Uh, but the thing is, is, because he was a minor, his identity is completely covered. His parents doesn't even know what he is. Uh, and things like that is making a commentary. These enemies do make commentary in that sense. Um, and what about our society? Uh, and it's not always this type of bold and spectacular type of society. Something like this comes through in Metropolis, right? And, and up front, it's huge, like it's some futuristic awesomeness. But deep down, as you look and peel through the layers, it's not like that. 